Patty Porter sat rocking on her wide front porch taking a sip from her still warm coffee cup. It was a cool October evening. She looked across the empty fields of the farm next door and realized that there would never be another crop to harvest. Her neighbor and friend, John Wilton, had passed on last winter. After his three children, long moved away, divided up their inheritance, the farm would most likely be sold and a housing tract put up in its place. Hattie realized she had done something that she never intended to do. At the age of 87, she had outlived her husband and all of her friends. The ones that you can always count on. The friends that stop over to have coffee or call reliably to check on you. She had lived here on Harvest Town Road for most of her life. When she and her husband, Henry, had first moved here, it was just a small farming community. Their house was a little two-bedroom farmhouse with a small plot of land, but the front porch was large. After they'd come to accept the fact that they would never have any children, they found that the tiny house was plenty big for just the two of them. Hattie and Henry Porter had also owned the two acres across the street. This was not unusual in a farming community. Having no immediate use for the land, Hattie thought she might like to try a pumpkin patch. So Henry had asked their neighbor, John Wilton, if he would turn up the ground with his tractor. Hattie planted the seeds in the spring after the last frost. And every year after, she would save the seeds from the largest pumpkin to use the following year. If they'd had a mild winter, Hattie would sometimes find that pumpkin vines had sprouted up, all on their own, from pumpkins left in the field. They had no irrigation system, so they had to rely on Mother Nature. If there was little rain, there would be little pumpkins. Most years, however, gave them a nice crop of big, beautiful pumpkins. They would load up their truck to sell some at a few local stores. But every year, a few days before Halloween, Hattie would take out a hand-painted sign that read, Free Pumpkins, Help Yourself, Happy Halloween in bright orange letters. She would hang it on a post directly across the street, and it became their tradition to sit out on the front porch sipping hot cider or coffee and watching the cars pull over and the laughing, happy children picking out their pumpkins. But Henry had been gone for almost 20 years now. Something brushed against her ankle, and Hattie looked down. Well. Mr. Midnight, I haven't seen you for a while. Have you been keeping out of trouble? A black cat with a small diamond-shaped patch of white on its chest looked up at her. Rising up slowly from her chair, Hattie said, I'll just be a minute. Coming back inside, Hattie carefully set down a small saucer of cream next to her rocker. As the cat lapped at the sweet liquid, she gently stroked the jet black fur. Henry would have liked you. She smiled. Mr. Midnight, so named because of his habit of showing up well past eleven at night, was a true feral cat, not trusting of human contact. Hattie had tried to coax him into the house, but he had refused, even on bitterly cold winter nights. So she had made a winter house for him out of a disposable foam ice cooler and placed it behind the wooden lattice under the porch. It had a little door cut into the side and soft leftover pieces of fabric on the bottom. Finishing up his late night treat, Mr. Midnight padded softly over to his spot at the top of the steps, curled his tail around him, and sat, looking across the long front yard towards the street. Hattie, comforted by the cat's presence, looked out as well. It was nice to have some company, she thought. It makes you feel a little less alone. The following day, after a breakfast of coffee and toast with jam, Hattie bundled up and headed outside to the small shed at the back of the house. She retrieved the wooden sign painted with bright orange letters, Halloween was almost here, and Hattie wondered suddenly if this would be her last one. 
shaking off the sudden burst of melancholy, which was unlike her. She headed past the house, through the long front yard, and across the street. She hung the sign on the post, then walked on to have a look at the pumpkin patch. There was a good crop this year. Pumpkins of every size and shape sat atop the dying vines. Hattie walked along searching for this year's pumpkin. It would sit at the top of her steps for a week, then she would harvest the seeds for next year and also make a few pies. After 10 minutes of meandering, Hattie found it near the back, the perfect pumpkin. Nice size, shape, and color, even if it was just a little too heavy. It came off cleanly from the vine and Hattie lifted it up to carry. She made it 10 steps before a sharp pain sliced through her chest. She went to set it back down, but all of the strength ran out of her hands and it fell to the ground with a heavy thump. And in excruciatingly slow motion, she followed it down. Then the world went dark. When Hattie came to, the first thing she felt was cold. All she could see was a large orange circle. As her eyes came into focus, she saw it was a pumpkin. A large crack ran down the center and some of the insides had spilled out. She began to remember what had happened and she slowly sat up, relieved to find that other than being extremely cold, she seemed to be okay. It was dark as Hattie walked carefully back to her house. The cat was waiting for her at the top of the steps. Okay, she said, still out of breath. I'll be back in a few minutes. Hattie began to warm up as she heated the coffee. When she stepped back out onto the porch, she had a saucer of cream and a large comforter that she wrapped around herself before settling into the rocker. Still shaken, she breathed a sigh of relief as she sat sipping hot coffee, looking out across the familiar fields. The cat remained on the porch until dawn. The woman still sat in her chair unmoving, and the cat could tell that something had changed. As he made his way silently down the steps and along the tall grass, he knew somehow that there would be no more sweet cream and no gentle hand moving along his back. The only human touch that he had ever known. One year later, on Halloween night, Daniel Davidson retrieved his strategically placed tennis shoes from beneath his bed and put them on. His parents had gone to bed half an hour ago, and the house was now completely still. He kept the lights off while moving quietly across the room to grab his backpack. His curtains were pulled back, and the light from the full moon made a long bright rectangle on the floor of his bedroom. Checking to make sure he had everything, Daniel moved to the window and looked out. He was worried. This had seemed like a cool idea when Trevor first told them at school on Thursday. Both Daniel and Jim had been all in. But by the time school let out on Friday, doubts had begun to set in. It would be a 20-minute walk to reach their agreed-upon meeting place at the turnoff to Harvest Town Road. A 20-minute walk alone at night. Daniel took a deep breath. He had to do it. If he chickened out now, Trevor would never let him forget it. So, gathering his courage, Daniel slid open his bedroom window and climbed out into the night. The moonlight brightened the lawn and sidewalk, but it seemed to make the shadows along the tree line darken. And he would have to keep to the shadows, at least until he got a little farther from home. Ten minutes later, Daniel was walking down the sidewalk. It was unlikely that any of his neighbors would spot him now. This should have lightened his mood. Instead, Daniel's sense of unease grew stronger. He should have just stayed home. He could have said that his parents caught him going out the window. He could have even made an enormous racket, ensuring Daniel's parents would check on him. Then it would actually be true. He stopped in his tracks thinking. 
It wasn't too late to go back. Just the thought of climbing back through his window into the safety of his bedroom allowed a feeling of sweet relief to rush into his chest and lungs. Yes, he was going back. There was a loud whistle from two blocks up, and just like that, Daniel's relief puffed out of existence like breath on a cold winter's night. Trevor Thompson, a seventh grader, was a year older than Daniel and Jim, his minions as he commonly thought of them, and he had taken it upon himself to make sure they showed up. Trevor knew that Jim would pretty much follow his lead, but he was never sure about Daniel. So Trevor had waited outside the convenience store on Del Mar Avenue. He had waited and watched the road. Daniel slowly lifted his head in a half-hearted wave and forced his feet to move forward. Trevor spoke in rapid, excited sentences. This will be epic. I found all these books in my sister's room. Before she left for college, she used to be all into this Wiccan and summoning stuff. And it says how to do it. You know, safely. Daniel, following along behind, muttered quietly. How to safely summon a demon? Don't be a drip, Daniel. We're out alone. On Halloween, Get into the spirit, man. Trevor snarked. The three boys made their way half a mile north on Harvest Town Road until they reached the hand-painted sign. Pointing at the little house across the way, Trevor said quietly, I heard that the old lady that lived there was a witch and she cast a spell over children who stole pumpkins. She was just a nice old lady that gave away free pumpkins on Halloween. Daniel replied, My parents used to bring me here every year when I was little. Free pumpkins, Trevor laughed, and they walked in amongst the rows of picked over pumpkins. As they walked along, the full moon shining down onto the large orange spheres dotting the ground, Daniel had to admit that it was pretty cool to be out here at night on Halloween. And after all, what was the likelihood that Trevor would actually be able to summon a demon? Zero to nil was Daniel's guess. This is a good spot, Trevor announced, dropping his backpack to the ground. Did you bring everything I told you to? Daniel and Jim nodded. Okay, Trevor said. You guys get everything out. I'm going to find the right page in the book. The boys knelt down and began to remove items from their backpacks. A bag of tea candles, a small mirror, a lighter, and two unopened containers of Morton iodized salt. Wait, Daniel said. Did you hear something? The three boys looked around, suddenly uneasy, listening. There was a light breeze and the rustle of blowing leaves, and beneath that, there was the faint sound of something crying. Quietly following the sound across the rows, they found the source. It was a cat, or what was left of a cat. It lay still, eyes closed. Something horrible had happened to its midsection, leaving a trail of bloody intestines spilling out. Every few minutes, the cat would raise its head slightly and let out a small cry. Oh no, Daniel murmured. Do you think it was hit by a car? Probably a coyote, Trevor said with authority. Then pausing, he looked back up to see his companions with a dawning interest. You know, he continued, the book says we need blood for the summoning to work. Absolutely not, Daniel shot back. We're not hurting an animal. The anger in Daniel's voice surprised Trevor, and he stepped back slightly. No, of course not. Look, the ground here is already soaked with blood. I just mean that we could draw the circle around the cat. We wouldn't hurt it. We should call for help. Maybe get it to the vet? Daniel suggested, looking over at Jim. Oh, that's genius, Trevor shot back. Look, if we call anyone, we're going to be grounded for sneaking out. And even if we did call, 
No one is coming out here at midnight on Halloween. Maybe somebody will come out tomorrow, but that cat isn't going to make it till morning. Just look at it. Daniel looked at the cat. The ground beneath it was soaked with blood. And he realized that for once, Trevor was right. The cat would never make it till morning. Jim chimed in weakly. If my dad founds out I snuck out, I'll be grounded forever. A long moment passed between them. Then Daniel, against his better judgment, gave in. All right, he said. Let's just get this over with. But I'll draw the circle. You stay away from the cat. And with that said, he took off his scarf, folded it into a makeshift blanket, and gently laid it over the cat, leaving only its head exposed. Trevor read from the book. While Jim and Daniel followed his makeshift instructions, they needed two nine-foot circles of salt with a five-pointed star at the centers. Since they hadn't thought to bring a tape measure, they paced off a rough estimate. Candles were set at the star's outer points. The circle with the cat would contain the demon. The other circle was where the boys would sit, hands together, while Trevor read aloud from the book. There were several warnings of the utmost importance. The first was to make sure that the lines were not broken. The second was to never step out of the circle. Not until the summoning was over and the demon was sent back to wherever it came. Okay, Trevor said. I think I've got it. Let's get started. The three boys stepped into the circle and sat on the ground, careful to keep the lines of salt undisturbed. Trevor began reading. I call upon the Golatia. I call upon the Notoria. I call upon the Demon of Vengeance, Ariok. Hear my call. I command you to enter into this realm. I command you, rise up within the star of five. I command you to answer my call. These were the words Trevor found written in careful script in the back of his sister's old book. But this book was happened upon by accident. And the words were written long ago. Trevor continued to repeat the summoning. In the middle of his seventh repetition, the wind picked up. Daniel, thinking that this was going nowhere and now waiting for Trevor to give up, had begun to watch the leaves dancing across the dried grass and withered vines. He followed the progress of one large orange leaf as it blew past them and then stopped about three feet above the now silent cat. After a moment, a shift in the wind caused it to move to the side and then continue on its way. Daniel, who just a moment ago had felt nothing but impatience, now felt the beginnings of a twisted knot of fear in his stomach. Hey, guys, look at the leaves. Trevor fell silent, and the three of them stared at the second circle of salt. It had been drawn only a few feet from this one, and suddenly it felt way too close. They watched the leaves tumble across the ground, with the occasional renegade entering the circle and seeming to pause, just for a moment, above the cat. Trevor, who was getting ready to call Daniel a moron, but was in actuality becoming a little bit nervous watched a large cluster of fallen leaves enter the circle. And in the space where the leaves would not go, he saw it. There was something large standing at the center. Jim screamed, Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Jumping up and backing away. And just as the back of his tennis shoe touched the line of salt, Trevor grabbed his arm. No! Trevor yelled in a panic shout. Don't leave the circle. Don't break the line. 
There was a hushed pause as the air around them became heavy, and though none of the boys would later be able to describe it, they all felt the same thing. It was as if something corrupt and extremely intelligent leaned forward with focused, greedy anticipation and waited. Jim, in a blind panic, began to pull away, but Daniel grabbed his other arm and pulled him back down to the ground. Shouting now at Trevor, Daniel yelled, Can you send it back? Trevor, not quite sure what was happening, nodded and picked up the book. The wind grew much stronger now and rifled the pages as Trevor flipped wildly through them. Finally finding what he was looking for, Trevor held it open against the howling wind and shouted, I cast ye demon out from this realm. I cast ye demon out from this realm. I cast ye demon out from this realm and back to whence ye came. As if on cue, the cat gave out a horrific howl and the wind fell silent. The three boys, dazed and frightened, looked at each other. Is it safe to leave now? Jim whispered. Trevor nodded. I think so. As if by communal consent, remaining inside their circle of salt, they threw their stuff back into the backpacks, zipped them up, and got ready to run. Daniel grabbed their shoulders and quietly stated, On the count of three. One. Two. Three. And the boys ran. They ran as if all the demons of hell were on their heels. They got to Jim's house on Apple Blossom Lane first, and he peeled off heading for his backyard, where he had left his bedroom window unlocked. Trevor's house was next. Then it was just Daniel, alone, running along the darkened sidewalk. And by the time Daniel passed the convenience store on Del Mar Avenue, a red-hot stitch had begun to pulse down the side of his chest. But he kept on running, back to his street, to his house, and back through the window. He managed to get his jacket off before collapsing onto his bed. After a while, his breathing slowed, but he couldn't sleep, not until the first light of dawn came in through the window. If you happen to be walking well past midnight on Harvest Town Road, you might notice an old pumpkin patch. In that deserted field, you might come across two large circles, one containing a dead cat. A little farther into the field, and you will find a crumpled navy blue scarf soaked with blood. It had blown across the dirt in a strong wind until it was caught against a large rotting pumpkin. The blood from the scarf soaked into the seeds, then down into the dirt. And even though it was a cold Halloween night, one of those seeds began to grow. It set out two small shoots into the ground. The shoots were not white. They were blood red. One of the shoots was hatred, and the other was rage. The three boys who had spent Halloween in a pumpkin patch never spoke of the incident to anyone. In fact, after that night, they stopped hanging out altogether. The winter and spring semesters passed, and Daniel spent most of summer vacation visiting his grandparents' farm. He had a good time feeding the cows and chickens, and Grandma Sally made excellent pies topped with homemade strawberry ice cream. Before he knew it, he was back in school, and Halloween was once again approaching. But Daniel no longer went trick-or-treating. In fact, he'd rather lost his taste for Halloween. He told his parents that he was staying home to hand out candy. So his parents took the night off and went out to dinner, leaving Daniel to hold down the fort. The previous week, 
They had done their usual Halloween tradition of carving up three pumpkins for decoration. Two were placed outside, on either side of the front door. The third was in the living room, candlelight flickering out the large window behind the couch. The two pumpkins outside the door didn't bother Daniel. But this large one, with its big smiling mouth and jagged teeth, made him uncomfortable. He decided to watch TV. The designated time allotted for trick-or-treating arrived, and little ghosts and witches marched up and down driveways, their bags filling up with chocolate gold, parents watching them from the sidewalk. And the evening wore on. Front lights began to turn off as the children made their way home. There was bath time and the careful removal of orange and purple makeup. Negotiations began around how much candy could be eaten before bed. And finally, the exhausted children slept. And the hour grew late. And the houses grew dark. And as the clock in the town square struck midnight, one of the carved pumpkins in a house on Juniper Lane moved just a little on the smooth surface of a polished table. It tottered up half an inch on one side, then the other. A few minutes passed, then it happened again. The movement, a little higher this time. The motions increased, becoming stilted and jittery, until something dark and thin pushed out from the bottom of the pumpkin. It was a blackened stick, and as it was birthed, it folded out from the main body into two long arms and legs. Rising up, it stood, its huge hollowed out pumpkin head still flickering with candlelight. The pumpkin, come to life, looked around the house. It moved from room to room, noticing everything from the pictures on the walls to little ceramic ghosts placed behind the centerpiece on the kitchen table. It halted when it looked down to the plastic kitchen garbage bin. Laying atop paper plates and scraps of food, the creature saw its own fleshy innards scooped out and thrown away like garbage. It reached up to touch the stem at the top of its head and it came right off. The whole top of its head came right off. In quick, panicky movements, the creature attempted to scoop the flesh and seeds back into its head, but the stick-like fingers allowed most of the slippery substance to fall through to the floor. After a few minutes, it gave up and just stood in utter despair on the red and white linoleum floor now flecked with bits of orange flesh. After a while, the despair turned to anger, then rage. All through the town, pumpkins rose up to walk the silent hallways and stand above sleeping children tucked cozily in their darkened bedrooms. And at the first light of dawn, parents rose early to turn on the coffee after a long night of strange dreams. Some of them noticed a splattering of seeds and sticky pulp across the kitchen floor. Others took note of pumpkins missing from tables and windows and outside of doors. It wasn't until a little after 7.15, when Mr. Withers walked out to retrieve his Sunday paper that the screaming started. He had noticed with disgust that even after giving out four boxes of full-sized candy bars, those damn kids had still stolen the pumpkins from his front porch. Walking back from the mailbox, he checked to see if his neighbors had been vandalized as well. And sure enough, the pumpkins were gone from the vicar's house too. Looking over towards his other neighbor's house, he saw that the Thompsons still had their pumpkins. That figured, that little brat Trevor Thompson was probably the one doing the stealing. 
He paused then, noticing that the pumpkins looked strange. Well, he said to himself, continuing back to his house, the Thompsons are a strange bunch. Mr. Withers sat at the kitchen table with a steaming cup of hot coffee. His wife had gone out to water the flowers in the front yard. Several minutes later, she began to scream. The police cordoned off Trevor Thompson's entire street. Their attempt to keep things quiet went to hell after a second massacre was found in a house on Apple Blossom Lane. It turns out that the pumpkins Mr. Withers had seen on his neighbor's front steps were the decapitated heads of the Thompson family. The brains had been removed and the hollowed out head scraped clean. The eyes and tongue were cored out, the mouth carved into a wide, jagged grin, and a lighted candle had been placed inside. Crime scene technicians found the eyes, tongue, and gray matter tossed haphazardly into the kitchen garbage can. A similar scene was found at Jim's house on Apple Blossom Lane. Daniel had developed a severe stomach ache after going to bed on Halloween. First thinking that it was too much candy, it turned out to be appendicitis, and he and his parents spent the evening night at the hospital. That's probably what saved them. Just before dawn, a black cat with a white diamond shape on its chest finished eating a fat field mouse. The cat, formerly known as Mr. Midnight, squeezed through the slats under the porch and made his way up to the top of the steps. He sat there, looking out across the long front yard to the flickering circles of orange light nestled here and there on the ground of the old pumpkin patch. And there was, in his mind, a faint memory of the taste of sweet cream. <laughs>